acquire property, hold property, uh, manage their properties, etc. So that's a lot of the business spent on. I do other things as well. I mean, I do contract disputes and, and minor litigation. Uh, I do not get into heavy litigation. I uh, usually partner up with uh, outside firms for that because um, it does happen. I have some clients that are um, one of my biggest clients is a. Uh, He's everything involved. So he's they acquire the property here, uh, and then they rehab the property. They sell the property, and then they scale as a property management company. So they have multiple businesses. Um, they get sued occasionally for different things. Um, one of them's involved in some behavior litigation. So when that happens, it's still my client that I, I hold hands and do everything else for. But then when it comes to certain matters, um, I outsource that. Uh, the law is very compartmentalized and cubbyhole. So even though you may have uh, business law as a cubbyhole. There's a lot of little coming hold inside of that. It takes a, a focus and a practice not to give the best service to the client. So, for example, uh, employment law is, is huge, and there's a lot of nuances to it that I just don't know. Um, so I can help the client in my own ways, and then I just partner up with others to help them in that. Um, same thing, personal injury, I don't touch it. Um, family law, I don't touch it. It's just, you can get in trouble if you try and do too much. Uh, if you're in a very small town, you might be able to source a, a small town for that and just do a kind of general practice. But once you get into um, these kind of areas, it just doesn't work that way. So that's my focus. Um, and then within real estate, it's it's everything that touches dirt for the most part. Uh, so if it's dirt and it's buildings, it's real estate. Um, so I do everything from you know, I do zoning compliances, whether or not they need your uh, do a variance or uh, a waiver uh, and get into that. Health and hospital violations come up a lot with, with landlord tenant matters, as you can imagine, um, especially when we have properties. Uh, and then everything in between. Oh. So that's kind of my we, we like that definition. Anything that's dirt, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. It doesn't, have to have, it doesn't have to be a building on it, it can just be vacant land and have stuff that work with it. So. Uh, whether or not it's uh, doing a parcel split, which is kind of big in the, the up and coming areas. Uh, you take a larger lot, you can split it, or maybe you can do a, a condo where they do a party wall, um, things like that, so you can maximize your lots and, and get more use out of it and value. That's great. Um, so one of the things that we were kind of chatting that we'd love to learn um, from you is like different situations and mistakes that we could avoid mm -hmm. or things that, you know, as um, non-experienced or little experienced okay. investors. Um, do you want to give any kind of specifics on there? Or do you, I mean, it's it's pretty broad on what you come across and it's, I'm always surprised. I mean, every time I come up, I'm like, wow, I didn't see that one coming. Um, I'd say, let's start from one side. Let's say you're yeah. looking into acquiring properties. Um, one of the challenges and one of the pitfalls I see some people do is, is they try to hide, they try to take too much anonymity. So they'll either acquire property in a land trust or they'll create an out of state entity that holds the property. And they simply want to say, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to be found. I don't know who I am. And that has as good as bad. Um, to avoid tax, to avoid a lot of people do it because they want to. They think they can avoid liability. They think if they can't find them, they can't sue them. And it's a misconception. I think if you if you Google land trust and acquiring property, you'll see a lot of that. Like, oh well, I have a land trust because then they don't know who I am, and I don't want people knowing my net worth. I don't know my business. And it's all well and good, but at the same time, if someone's going to sue you, they're going to find a way. And there's other tools around that. Uh, there's service by public notice. So if I can't find someone, I and I've done my due diligence, I can still file a lawsuit and do it via public notice for the newspaper. It's going to run three times over the course of a month. I may end up getting a default judgment. You're never going to know you're sued. So there's there's places for it, but you got to be careful. Um, I think. And out-of-state entities, if you do it for tax purposes and, and you have an account that says, hey, we're going to do this for these reasons, that's okay because you can still then register as a foreign entity doing business here, get a registered agent, and you can satisfy the requirements as far as having uh, notices so that you'll know that if something happens you'll get notice of that so if it's for tax purposes and your CPA says look this is why we're doing it this way that's okay just make sure you safeguard yourself and then you register it in Indiana as a foreign business doing business here in Indiana it's just a simple filing with the Secretary of State you get a local registered agent um, most attorneys do it for free or you can pay there's there's national companies that do it for nominal fees hundred dollars a month a year uh, and then that gives you notice. So then if you do ever get sued or if the government needs to notify you of 
um, any kind of violations of board health health neighborhood associations things like that they at least know where to serve that and you don't get hit with this blind side of all of a sudden you're up for a tax sale because you're like i didn't know about these blue um, so that's one thing to be careful of uh, and then you go on the back side so once you acquire properties i see a lot of people that uh, this comes more into play with out-of-state investors. So Indiana, Indianapolis is a hot market for out-of-state investors, especially out west. Um, they're doing their their exchanges because they can get property a lot here cheaper than they can out there, um, and then they can they can reinvest that money. So they're buying things sight unseen. They don't care. They're just like buy it. So it's it's inflated our cost our entry point costs, but for them it's still good. Um, the downside is is a lot of people are relying on. Not so much the agent, but once they acquire the property, they're relying on general contractors. They have not vetted. it. Um, you got to vet your contractors, and that's a that's a big one I see come across. And that's the ones where I get involved that and I outsource it because it ends up being too much litigation. So one is vet your contractor. Number two is for, vet your for contractor. What? I mean, what what so, what what are the pitfalls of using a contractor that you don't that you have not vetted? Uh, so there's a lot of people out there that they they go get three bids. And one will just be a lot cheaper, and they won't necessarily bet. And that, it happens a lot. It's sometimes a lot. I see a lot of same contracts with their lawsuits. So they underbid on purpose, and then it's change order, change order, change order. And all of a sudden, that initial bid is way up here, and it's not anticipated. And it's like, well, we had a change order. No, these things should have been anticipated. But the way they do it is a change order in the contractor. And then on top of that, they have a bad contract. They don't have no lien contracts in place. So then now you're Sixty thousand dollar budget is now up to a hundred thousand dollars, and and you're like you're mad at the contractor, and then the contractor puts a lien on your property. So now your property is tied up. So when you're going to do a flip, now you got a lien on there, and you can't sell it. Um, so vet them, and then vet them, and vet them again. And on top of that, even then, utilize things like no lien contracts. Um, get yourself. I mean, that's what I do for my clients. I I, I do a template for them. So I, I do a one time fee. I give them the no lien contract, they can modify that for the next project. Uh, and then they'll usually just say, hey, check, can you just, I made modifications. You know, can you just look over this one time? And I charge a, a super reduced fee for that. Uh, but the no lien contract, then obviously, as you can imagine, it's just that. It's they can't put a lien on the property. So even if there's a dispute between the contractor and uh, the owner, or even subcontractors and the owner, they can't lien the property. If they try to, you can immediately yeah, take off. I have off. more questions too. Yeah, it's a good point. Have you found a lot of contractors who um, are reluctant to sign a lien contract? No, not the good ones. No. Um, you may have to restructure it. So a lot of times you've got that either 30, 30, 30, um, you know, or quarters. So it's they want money up front and then they want so much on certain performances. You may have to shorten those times that you pay, um, or you may have to just offset that in different ways. What's 30, 30, 30? Mean? So the contract. Contractors want a third up front, a third upon such a completion date, and then a third upon completion of the whole project, um, or you know any kind of criteria thereof. Um, now, when you get a no-lien contract, they're a little more hesitant because they don't want to go that far before getting paid, uh, especially with the risk of not being able to lien the property. So you may have to you know do it as a weekly or a, a, a monthly, something along those lines. But still, if they're a good contractor, you can you can. You should be able to minimize the risk by saying, this is what I'll do to safeguard you, to safeguard me, and they should be willing to do it. Otherwise, find yourself in the contractor. So let's back up on vetting. I mean, super, super simple. So, you know, old school mm -hmm. was like better business bureaus mm -hmm. where we used to go. What, what's the new vetting of contractors besides like your network? Uh, I, with you guys, it's a little different because I would say, you know, have your agent kind of help you out, especially if you're out of state. So if you're representing these out of state buyers, um, get in contact. If you guys are just personally doing it, um, it's it's word of mouth. You're gonna have to go there and, and talk to other other investors, um, get involved in the, the groups, the uh, Syria, Enria, the different groups like that. And there's typically there's so many out there that use them. Um, you can go on to the public records and see, like you said, better business bureau. And you can go to the, the court records and see how often they're involved in lawsuits. And, and see what the base of those lawsuits are. And wow. A lot of times that contractors will be on there several wow. times. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would feel for our group, you have a network in place where you can vet contractors, or we are better positioned within our office and in our industry to 
make some more headway as opposed to somebody from California who's just picking up the phone yes. and knows no one. Right. Yeah. So we're, I feel like we're ahead of the game in regards to our contacts and our abilities to sniff out good people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's great. I, I just try and give you a little piece of mind for if you have clients that come in, but as opposed to just your personal investments too. But you're, I agree. Yeah, but you're gonna but I think it's our, it's our, I think it's a, as part of our job description is to have those referrals ready to go. Yeah. Yeah, so, so back to this no lien contract. So whatever LLC that I have for my investment property, mm-hmm. I get a contract to you for a no lien contract. And mm-hmm. then I say, okay, if you want to work with me, here's my mm-hmm. contract. Yeah. And then I pay you and we move on to the next thing. Yeah, so the no lien contract is, uh, I mean, do you guys normally do flips or what's your, what is your tipples? <laughs> well, right now we're on hold, but okay. we have had some experiences with flips. Okay. Our investor mentors would say they never have lost money on hold. Okay. They have lost money on flips. Yep. So kind of from the top down on mentoring, we're pushing hold. Okay. It's just that the market is, um, there's not a lot of properties right now. Mm-hmm. And so we're trying to speak to people like you that are super knowledgeable so that when the market does open up, yep. we can have lots of learning curve okay done. okay so but even in the hold i mean i think there's going to be opportunity to buy those not dilapidated but you're going to have to do some for sure Absolutely. and then it depends on what you're getting into if you're getting into those if you're getting the whole properties where it's just you can acquire some equity pretty quick and then you're just going to hold it and rent out and place caramel fishers you know or side zionville um, they're probably going to have huge rehab projects too then. but if you start getting these um, potentially higher ticket items with higher profitability, which you can do. Right? And this does come into the flip side more like the fountain square with the blue light. Yes, right? and that's important because we have clients. I mean, we have clients that are doing that. So yeah. this is important. I mean, that's a big takeaway for me. I didn't know that people could have a no lien contract. So yeah, yeah. So there's a huge takeaway. There's a part of the statute that actually addresses that in the mechanics of this section. And if you have a contract in place, has a certain stipulation. Uh, and it's certain criteria, it has to be recorded within five days of being signed, it doesn't have to be recorded, uh, but then that puts all contractors and subcontractors on notice they can't be in the property. Um, and then it does come in more play of you know, major rehabs of that nature. So on the hold side, maybe not, maybe, but um, you, you know, your chances of a lien attaching on, on a hold property are probably a little lower because your, your, your overall investment is gonna be on the acquisition, not on the, the rehab. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You say there's something that has to be recorded when you do this contract? Yeah, so what I do is I have the contract, which is a little, not lanky, but it's, it's a contract. Um, we don't like short contracts. So, but then it has, <laughs> you just record a memorandum. So it actually has that, and then it truncates it into a one page memorandum. You record the memorandum with the secretary's, or I'm sorry, with the recorder's office. Is that something I can easily do, or do I go, go through someone like you? Or? For the entire contract? For the recording the memorandum. The recording is easy. You can do that. Is but it online or is it? Well, it, it's just like you record a deed. So it's the memorandum is embedded in my contract. So it's the entire contract and it actually has that as an attachment to the memorandum. Uh, and then it's all one package. Most of the, I think most of the time you work in the train and gets that original contract, it'll have that in there. And then you just, that's why I do mine as a word template. So for the most part, it has contract. It's fairly boilerplate now because I've used it enough times. Uh, and then your, your modification will be who the parties are involved. And then you'll have an attachment as an exhibit, which is the scope of work. So that's always going to change. But then that's the one page that's going to change based on wage work is. So yeah. you'll say, hey, I need, a, I need an estimate. That scope of work will be in there as an attachment. Uh, and then the memorandum, again, just, just uh, references the actual contract. Is that the, the actual process of recording? Is it emailing to somebody? Is it, is it an oh. online submission? Or who's recording that? And what's the action? Okay, so I want to do that. There are two ways you can do it. You can you can use third party services to actually do it electronically. You can key record, um, or you just go yeah. down to or wherever the recorder's yeah. office is. In San Juan County, you go to the recorder's office. And you just, um, it's, I think the contracts are. Forty dollars, roughly. And the deeds are thirty-five, and then it goes up according to how many pages there are, um, and then the contracts are forty. But it's an, it's not a huge fee. You just go there in person, and if, or if not, you can mail it in and get it recorded. Yeah. 
Good. That was a good takeaway. Okay, that's good. All right, what's your next nugget? <laughs> <laughs> um, how much of do you guys do individually or with partners on properties? I have a partner. A partner? Okay, so do you have an LLC you guys own as a partnership? Um, well, I guess we're both 50-50 members. Mm -hmm. Of the LLC? Yeah. Okay. If you're going to do that, then you need to be careful when you set up your LLC. Did you get your operating agreement? You have to buy cell provisions in there? Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. Here we go to partnership. Right, let's talk about that because we, okay. in our reading last night, or I read it last night, uh, in our reading, they talked about like basically investor groups. and. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'd love to know the nitty gritty of that. Okay. So <clears throat> there's two ways. 99% of businesses in this nature are going to be LLCs. Uh, you're not going to do corporations. Um, obviously not, it's not going to be non for profit. Uh, there is a new tool in Indiana called a series LLC. Newer. It's only, I think, 2017 or 2018, some You can do series. Um, so can I try Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I would love that. So Traditionally, you would have your LLC, right? Oh. And that would be your, your member. So member one, member two. That would be member one. Yes. See for every property, right? For is that right? That? Yeah, I mean, this is why. So, okay. this means that there's no cross polarization, right? So, if you get sued, all they can go after is the assets of this LLC, they can't go after the assets of this LLC. And then, as you can imagine, you know, as you acquire properties, there's a lot of accounting because each one's gonna have its own EIN, its own bank account, yeah. etc. So it becomes how many checkbooks you want to carry on your car, right? Mm -hmm. oh, so now, as legal counsel, are you advocating pre-2015, were you advocating this method where every property was its own LLC? Or are you saying, okay, once you get to a certain amount, then we probably need to do another one? That's what the question is. So it's, there's two ways you can do it. If, if you really want pure protection, this was the best way, right? Or you would say, okay, I want to know, I'd rather just take my liability at 200k and once I break that threshold then I form a new one uh -huh. okay or you can have all of it under here and you can get an umbrella policy for insurance purposes okay <clears throat> you can do all of that the, the new tool and I still don't mind this because it doesn't become a nightmare for this but I don't mind doing this for clients where it's easier to just say hey what's your threshold what's your risk tolerance is it is it 250 is it 300,000 before we form a new one if you're going to continue to continue to grow, uh, Indiana has now what's called a series LLC. So this, oh, Indiana. I feel like this is progressive. It started on the coast like 10 years ago. Right? <laughs> Whatever. It all comes from the coast. <laughs> so series LLC, you'll have a master LLC, and then you'll have series underneath there, et cetera. Okay. Now, this is just for demonstrative purposes. There still isn't, there's no ownership here. The master does not own the series. But the way they structure it visually is you create the master and you have series underneath there. Okay. Now what the advantage is, is you still have, there's no, there's no cross polarization. So each one is severed independently. Each one can have its own members. Each one can have its own real estate, et cetera. But the advantage is you can have one EIN and one bank account. I feel like that's all day long. Now, you still have to have very strong internal records. So you still have to show that, you know, when you got that gallon of paint, you go to this house or this house. When you had the, the wood floor in place, you have to have detailed accounts. You still have to show all that. But the advantage is, again, it's you don't have to have checkbooks, you know, crazy. You don't have to have five credit cards. You can do this. Uh, it's a little more expensive. So the upfront cost um, to form an LLC. For the Secretary of State, if I remember right, it's $95, and then this is about $250. So it's a little bit more upfront cost to form the series. Um, but the advantages over the long haul, you start getting to high volume properties. What about, what about each series you make? Is that an additional cost? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, it's an additional cost for each one. So you form this the first time, and you're, you'll have an operating agreement. It's a little bit different. You reference those each time you form a new series, you have to register that again. So that ownership group in Master LLC could be 70 30. As far as the members? Um, yeah, so member one could own 70%, member two could own 30% in the Master LLC. No, you would have you would have your membership, so it would be like your members would be down here. And it yeah, end up there. I mean, the master can be its own, and then when you form a new series, you would still you could designate different percentages. Got it. So each series is going to have its own operating agreement. The master has its own operating agreement, and the series has their own operating agreement. They're separate and distinct. So these can have different members. Yeah, so I could be with series one with Jane, series two with Angela. Yeah. Potentially. Okay. And then the only one caveat there is once you start getting the different members that are different free series, you may want to think about the new EA in that point then because then you start getting to talk to your account on that because you need to have separate records there on how the distributions go. Um, since it's not since it's different each one. And you can just as easily take this and do a master with James and a master with Angela. Right. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Back to the risk. Uh, mm -hmm. of the 200,000, like what, how do you come up with that? Not, not the value property. Comfort? So if this property is at 75,000, the value of it, you know, this one's at 75,000, you know, we're at 150, so the next one's gonna push over that, so we're gonna make, okay. take this one. Right oh, okay, I understand. Um, but when you say the risk though, is there like a percentage of liability risk that you like to add in? No, so the, again, so, if I get sued, so why am I getting sued? Huh. Well, you guys are doing property <laughs> holds, so I assume you're gonna have tenants in these. Yeah. So why are so, why are you, let's do some why the tenants are suing us? Yeah. So faulty handrail, and they fall down and break their neck, right? Then they sue you. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna secure that handrail, right? So I have that real world example. I didn't get sued, but my tenants. Um, I had a the property had had water issue above the garage and then so they just took out all the drywall of the garage and then fixed the other parts of the house and and rented it and like a couple months into the contract uh, it turned cold and they're like hey we want you to we want you to drywall the garage again because um it's cold, it's letting in the air. And I was like, oh, this house is rented, you know, sorry. And um, then they came back and was like, well, it's fire code. They looked it up and, it, and I didn't know that, but it was fire code to have the ceiling um, and anything facing interior wall mm -hmm. to have the, um, yeah, this yeah. is like 10 years ago. So I was really new and naive, but um, I know that as a realtor now. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, that's okay. We don't want to do that. But yeah, they and so then I like had to jump on it, Johnny, on the spot. But like, if they if a fire would have happened, I probably would have got sued. I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so anything negligence? I mean, you're not going to get you're not going to get sued. You will get sued, but you know, you'll have a you'll have a defense against if it's well, my property got destroyed. Um, things like for like rain damage or something like that. It's like, well, my personal property got damaged. And most of the times, your lease is going to address that. They have to carry on the insurance. Right. Um, but if it is on something they can claim negligence, got it where uh, the, there was a, a handrail on the outside. So there was, it was the old style house where it had the steps that went down into the basement on the outside mm -hmm. and that handrail was loose. Um, and on top of that, where it connected on the bottom was actually disconnected. Um, and so that was loose and there was some pipe or something stick up in the yard and the little, the little boy tripped and, and hit his head on there and with a, Med check and I mean, he was hurt. It was, you know, I don't know, $600 in medical fees, stitches, and etc. And they got sued for that because they knew about it and they didn't address it quickly mm -hmm. enough. Um, so you will get sued, but it, so if we talk about Bo's example, like, is he compelled as the landlord to make sure that he has drywall up to code? Well, you're the owner, yeah, you're responsible. So, as a, as a landlord and the owner, you're responsible for making sure that everything's co compliant. You're, you're adhering to the health and hospital um, requirements, etc. So if you're if you don't have that, then you're at fault. Yeah. So that was one of my questions. I was waiting until you kind of got through your whole list, but it's a good time. Is there a place I can go? I mean, obviously I can read the tedious code, but I don't really want to learn that. So, sir, if I hire a, a 
an in some inspection service or how do I know that I'm compliant <laughs> if I want to be, you know, the best possible position I can be? I mean, there's so much on the code. I don't know if you're, we're gonna, you're not going to know all of it. Yeah. I don't think there's any way to. So, so if you want to say health and hospital compliant, what does that mean? So there's, there's health and hospital code, it's administrative code. So you got the Indiana code and you have administrative code. Administrative code is typically that sort of thing. So it says that uh, as a landlord, you have to provide a refrigerator or stove unless the lease specifies that it's on the onus of the tenant. You have to provide a fridge and, and a stove. Uh, and I've had that, I've had to actually defend that lawsuit. And the reason is it was a poorly written lease. It's a poorly written lease. So what the lease is, it said, it said owner will not provide stove and fridge, right? But we got sued anyways, and they had a good attorney, and he said, well, the code says that the, it has to specify that the tenant is required. Your lease doesn't say that. Yeah. It's obvious. <laughs> like, if it says this, well, who, what? I was like, God, like, do you really want to court for this, or you want to sell? And we, you know, we have to we sell it. It wasn't an expensive lawsuit, but so you have to really care about those sort of things. And you don't know that hurts. So that a service you provide, provide as <laughs> far as, because I, I think I pulled down my lease contract from, um, an ex, you know, a perfect, an experienced investor here. Yeah, yeah. Is, is that something I could send to you to just make sure it's good? scrub it? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I found that. So me personally, if people ask me to do that, I have a, I just charge a flat fee amount. I charge one hundred fifty dollars for a lease, yeah. and I've used it. I've defended it. Um, I've modified it over time so certain things come up and I tweak it. Yeah. Um, I mean, smart goes. money is paying someone like Chad. Okay. Up front to get an airtight lease long. before you start putting people in there. For what, what I was getting at is for me to, it's probably what, like a 12 page lease? Maybe? S somewhere at 10 so for, yeah. for me to review it, it's going to take longer for me to review that than just to provide you one that I know yeah. inside and out. That's good. Point. And then you can review That's the system. Mm -hmm. And you can review the chat. Yeah. So back to the LLC up here. Mm -hmm. So looking at like the master and the series mm -hmm. LLCs, to me that sounds very complicated and um, probably pretty expensive getting all these different LLCs in. Would it be cheaper and easier just to do one LLC, put all the properties in there, and then have the umbrella? <clears throat> um, well, that's what I was saying. I mean, you can, it, it's yes, it's less expensive on the upfront costs. Yeah. Um, but you're still, it depends. Yeah, I guess you have to talk to your insurance agency what that above is going to cost you on a year to year, because at one point it's going to you know, it's going to climb up pretty high, and then you still have I mean, then you're still at risk. So even if your insurance policy, I don't know, maybe the insurance policy, well, we're not covering that. You're still all your stuff's at risk at that point, or at least this. I mean, it's at least this and with this, you know, you can still eliminate some of that, that risk. Did, did you say yeah. that? It doesn't yeah. say why, why does it sound yeah. expensive, James? Well, you're, you're paying for each one of those LLCs within the master. So Right, you know, but you're choosing how many assets you're putting in each series. So just raise the amount of assets that you're putting in each one before when you, you raise, feel compelled. When you raise the assets, then you defeat the whole purpose. Well, so James, what I mean is, that, so this is ideal, right? For every single one. That's an accounting nightmare. If you start getting a lot of properties, Instead of this, this is the better tool because then you don't have to have the bank accounts, etc. So if this is your model that you're comfortable with, like, hey, I want to have as much protection as possible, I'm still going to do maybe a little bit of uh, basket bundling, but not a lot. Then I would still go with this route. If you're not going to ever get to a huge amount of properties, then you could probably just do this with an umbrella policy. But that'd be a talk you would have your insurance agent too to say, hey, what's my what's my total coverage? What's the maximum that an umbrella policy will up to? Um, and then I don't know what the, it, I should assume it covers as much as you want. As much as you pay for it. Yeah. You know I mean? <laughs> um, Chad, I, I, I have, have a question. question. Yeah, go if for you, it, Chad. If, you, if you've started at one, can you switch to the other? Like if you started at Yes, yeah, so you can, you can switch from an LLC to a, to a series. There's a conversion for that. Um, but you cannot convert to, how does it work? You can convert to a master. I can't remember if we can convert from this to a, I think you can. I have to look it up. I've only done the one conversion and it's for a master. So if you started out and you've got one property and you've got an LLC, if over the next couple of years you have three, four, you can switch to a yeah. master. Yeah. Correct? Okay. Yes. 
Um, so you recommend for sure having a separate entity. So like I'm under contract now for an investment property and it's mm -hmm. in the name of my, my S Corp, my real estate company S Corp. Okay. Bad idea. Bad idea. Yeah. Okay. You got yeah. title in your escort? <laughs> it's not. I mean, it's, I just went under contract with it. So I, I mean, I'm here explaining that why, because I also have an escort. So that would be where I would liability, right? So it's exposing the the assets in my regular real estate company to liability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So a thousand percent, you want a different silo Who's for your crap? investment real estate needs to be completely separate from Todd Dickman, the realtor. Yeah. Like tomorrow. Like today, like yeah. Chad, like yesterday. yesterday. I don't know yet. So. I don't know. <laughs> Point of emphasis. That's the whole. That's this is the whole reason we're talking about that is that your personal wealth, your family wealth, your kids' education fund, yeah. everything is siloed separately. So when you do get sued, you're mitigating your risk. Right. I've got a question for you. Is it a bad idea if you have this LLC form for your investment properties? Mm -hmm. Is it a bad idea to hold? cash in there? Uh, a large amount, yeah. Well, why? Why would you? Well, you're just waiting for the next investment to pop up. Well, why do you need to hold it in the LLC? Where, that's what I'm saying. Where would you put it? Can you have it in a, in a master LLC? Well, accounting let's, say you, let's say you had a property and you okay. sold it. Oh, okay. And you had a lot of cash. So, you know, the money goes into your bank account and you're just waiting for the next opportunity. Mm -hmm. Would you not hold it in there? Would you hold it somewhere else? Well, I would just, just take it out. I mean, take it out and do what? Put it in your, in your bank account. Yeah, but it's just not as it easy when I got my partner. Because, yeah, like, what if what if my part, what if my member LLC, we cash out, now we've got 300 grand and it's in our LLC and we're partners. You still have, so an LLC is a flow through entity. So, from the tax purposes, once you get to the end of the year, you still have to claim that as profit. So mm -hmm. why not just do the distribution and you can refund the you can uh, refund the LLC at that time. So just take the distribution, to put it in your personal account, and yeah. then do whatever with it, and then yeah, when the next so so loan back, back to your LLC. Correct. Whenever you, yeah, you because it, again, it's again. a it's a flow through entity. So even if you keep the cash in the LLC at the end of the year, you got to claim it as profit. Mm -hmm. So okay. why not just take it out of there, and then when it's time to do property, then you and your partner just reloan the LLC the money. So your advice is never to keep much cash in your LLC. No, you gotta keep some in there for operating money, but large, yeah. no large amounts. Right. Huh. That's yeah. another aha. Uh -huh. Yes, definitely. We have just filled the day, Chad. That's great. Well, and, and I definitely appreciate the risk management, but let's also talk about how we don't want to get sued. So really good tenant screening up front would be a way to uh, reduce risk. Yeah. By screening, um, by making them pay an application fee where you do credit and criminal, having a good lease. Uh, I mean, I mean, I'm not I'm not necessarily overly concerned about future litigation from it because I feel like I'm taking the right steps up front. So maybe maybe you could talk to about what that looks like to how you can reduce or mitigate or mitigate risk up front in tenant screening or lease or that piece of it yeah so the lease is going to be a big one uh tenant screen um there's like what's john spafford's company uh, uh, national national tenant tenant network. Network. yeah so someone like that that can just do the tenant screen because then you can offset that to like you have to still give them the criteria hey here's what i want for uh annual income past two paychecks uh, etc you can't discriminate obviously so excuse me as long as you have that stuff in place that's not discriminatory, you can give that criteria and just be consistent. I've read, is this a true statement that um, if you have, or it's actually, actually recommended to document your criteria and yeah. have it on file, like dated and time yes. stamped that way, if someone claims that you are discriminating, yes. you're like, no, this has been my procedure the whole time. Yeah. Is that something that you have available as well? Uh, I think I have them. Um, usually, I've, I have them somewhere. I haven't had to use them that much for my clients. Usually it's, they work with John or something like that. They come up with, but yeah. Because like the, the key one too for me was credit score. Because when I first started out, I didn't really know what credit score I wanted to accept. Yeah. And like pretty quickly, I, I got application of like say 580 <laughs> and 602. And like the 602 credit report looked worse to me. Like even though the score was 602, 
than the 580 because the 580 was like one thing that was bad and they recovered and mm -hmm. it had like years of good history. This one's like just choppy all the way through. I'm like, I prefer that one, but because I had started at 600 with my thing, I could like, can't go against it or whatever. But you can like write a you can amendment or something. Yeah, you can deviate say. based on criteria. I mean, it doesn't have to be a, it doesn't have to be a hard and fast. And I'd say those are the, I, I, I think I've dealt with one discriminatory lawsuit on an application process. Okay. Um, they usually don't. They're not usually the, the bulk of it. Usually it comes down to, most of my eviction work a lot of times it's, it's downtown, a lot of it is. Uh, slumlord, I've got, that's a guy's claim. Uh, I've got mold. Mold is the number one thing that we get on county claims. It's, well, I didn't want to pay rent because there's mold on the property. Um, Are they normally legit? No. Mm, no. Interesting. No, because they claim mold, but it might be mildew. I mean, unless no. you go and get a true diagnosis. Yeah. Most of the time it's not mold. That, though, if you, like a company like uh, National Tennis Network, they eliminate all that stress, all yeah. that. You don't even have to think about it. You type in their information and it spits you out a yes or no. Okay. And I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but as long as you're consistent with that, mm -hmm. if you got sued, you just, hey, here's who I use. Yeah. And I use it with everybody. And What's that cost? It's like $35 or something. Like yeah, it's $50 it's to report. You got to pay a one time application fee oh, and then depending on what you want them to run there's an associated cost that usually you just pass along to the tenant yeah. of that amount mm -hmm. uh, you just give your tenant an application fee to cover it right yeah um so in hamilton county would you all well we'll talk about one of these but um what, what do you see like what comes across your world from a two standpoint what are the most common ones it's still typically the same thing as landlord didn't repair the stuff I asked them to. And, and usually it's always uh, retaliatory. Uh, usually it's because they've started an eviction process and they're like, well, I didn't pay rent because. Mm -hmm. um, that's typically the. What, what does the right? eviction process look like in Indiana? In Indiana? Okay. Right now? <laughs> <It's nuts. laughs> yeah. I didn't want to talk about that. Like, yeah. what, can you give us the current state of affairs on the eviction um, yeah. board hourly when I said that we're in moratorium? Yeah, okay. yeah, so right now it's, it's, there's a couple. There's the CDC ban, which goes through December 31st, and that's for anything related to not paying the rent. You can't do it. Um, it doesn't address other lease violations, uh, but anything if it's not paying the rent, you can't evict. Uh, and then Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they had their own as well. It was for any, any home that was backed by a Freddie Mae loan, Fannie Mae. Freddie and Fannie is what we call them. Okay. If it was backed by one of those two, you couldn't evict. Um, if it was Section 8 or HUD housing, then you couldn't evict. What are your thoughts on the legality of the CDC saying you can't evict people? I don't know. I mean, I, that's kind of, that's getting into the constitutional law, so that's probably about my wheelhouse of what I weigh in on. Okay. I'm surprised. Yeah. But I didn't think that they... Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised at a lot of things where they stepped in and said that I'm going to not a reason to say. So January 1st, uh, Mary's tenant hasn't paid. Mm -hmm. What what happens? I don't know. It's <laughs> let's let's say that no, it, let's say evictions are back on. Yeah. So normal. So Hamilton County, I've found is is a little bit slower than Marion County, depending on the township. Uh, there's some townships are that's going to be more. Uh, efficient. Uh, Wayne Township is very efficient, they're fast, and you can usually get in there within two and a half weeks uh, for eviction. Um, some of the townships are a little bit further back. Sitter Township is pretty saturated. Uh, they can be five weeks from the time you file to get a court date. Well, let's walk through it. Okay, so here's the landlord, Chad. I need to file an eviction. Sure. Uh, first thing is if you have a lease. So there's a there's a misconception out there for you have to file a 10 day notice to quit. Um, and you'll see a lot of tenants say that to me. Well, you give a 10-day notice. So if you if your lease doesn't specify, if you just say rent is 100, $150 a month, right, but you don't say it's due on this day, then, yeah, technically you have to give a 10-day notice to quit. So that means you have to give this notice that says your rent is late, you have 10 days to vacate the property or pay the rent. And if they don't do that, then you can evict. If you have a lease that just says rent is always due on the 1st or rent is always due on the 15th, that law does not apply to you. You can just evict immediately. Assuming your lease doesn't have anything else in there. So a lot of leases will say you have five days to pay or 
et cetera. But in fact, what about a late fee? Does that cause no problem? No, okay. no, that's just simply another tool. But if it does say, uh, if it says something they're like, you know, rent's due on the first and you have a grace period, then yeah, you gotta wait till that grace period is over. Okay. But not like you don't you don't even have to wait ninety days. Ninety days. Like this is one missed payment is very different. So one missed payment and you can evict. We're in Indiana. Though. I know. <laughs> I know. Trust me, I've been here for twelve years. I'm still trying to accept that. So, so, so tell, tell us again. So they just don't pay. Yeah. And then you can. You yeah. can evict. So you can file you file for the eviction. Typically, what I do as an attorney is I I send a lease and a ledger. So the lease is I just simply make sure it doesn't have any of those provisions that have grace periods or anything like that. And on a ledger, it just says the amount that's due. <clears throat> so the file for the eviction, you get a court date. Uh, typically it's four weeks out um, and then I don't require my clients to go with me if it's for non-payment. Um, I can just get an affidavit, I have a ledger, because uh, it flips the burden of proof. So in Indiana, you have the affidavit and then if it's for non-payment, it actually flips the burden to them to prove that they paid. Wow. Mm -hmm. What kind wow. of receipt, uh, kind of uh, accounting or ledger how um, sophisticated? Yes. No. It, I mean, most of my clients just have some. It depends. If you use your, some clients are very good. Like they have a software they use for the property management, and it's you know it's your typical ledger. So it'll be rent due, rent paid, and you know, ongoing, ongoing, and then a balance due at the end. Uh, but if you have, if you're just using Excel, I use that too. It's fine. Uh, and then you, you get your eviction. You go in court. They show up, and it's going to be you know, here's the affidavit, judge. Here's a ledger. Um, if they dispute it, then they may reset it for a contested hearing. But a lot of times, you know, a lot of times, they, if 99% of the time, it says, no, I'm, I'm late. And then the judge will set the possession date. Typically, it's usually the next week, five to seven days. Wow. So and that's they, <coughs> Do they normally represent themselves? Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Very rarely with an attorney. If they have an attorney, then there's something else going on. Got or it. something else that's being started. Or... I had the evicted tenant once, and I called Chad. And um, let's say the rent was due September 1st, and I called Chad on September 5th. <clears throat> they were out October 5th. That's amazing. It was hmm. literally 30 days. From wow. From, yeah. If you or, or close to that. So there's a there are some dangers that you have to be careful. Not dangers. There are some. Let's do the worst case scenario, right? You mm -hmm. not paying the rent. They're clearly they don't they don't deny it. So you get to the court date day before they file bankruptcy. <laughs> so I've had this happen. So they call bankruptcy, everything stops. So then you have to file with the bankruptcy court a uh, motion for relief from the state. So you get a stay. Um, that's the term of bankruptcy. It means a stay of all proceedings. So you can't collect on any debt, et cetera, as long as they name you. So you have to file for relief from the state. Uh, and then you have to wait a certain time to pass. And if they don't do that, then the bankruptcy court will give you an order to allow you to continue in your state court proceedings. Um, so then, and then it goes on from there. And then, they don't move out, so they have to force move out. So you have to get a constable actually come out there to force move out. Uh, that can drag it out pretty good. Um, um, what kind of protection do you have um, during that week um, when their Michigan date is so they don't destroy the house? None. None? Yeah, I had a client that they were going to evict him, but the people moved out, trashed the house, did like $10,000 worth of damage, and left the key hanging on the hook outside. Yeah, so that's the danger. Is you can, in small place where um, you're capped. Uh, Mary County just, I'm sorry, Hamilton County just adopted. Mary County has always been $8,000 for at least five years. And, and on top of that, you can get your attorney fees. Uh, Hamilton County until last year was $6,000 inclusive of attorney fees. That was the max you could get on a judgment. Danger is like what you're saying is you go to a big, you don't, you don't know the inside the condition of the property. So you think, okay, I'm just going to do eviction. They've, up until recently, they've always been good paid tenants, never been a property. You open up the door and it's like, what is going on here? And you're kind of stuck. So that's the danger. It's a lot cheaper to go through small claims court uh, than it is to go through superior court, but you are capped at those damage limits. Um, but it's cheaper and it's faster. So unless you have a reason to believe that, one, there's a lot of damage, and two, you're ever going to recover anyways, you're still probably better off to get back quick. So is it... Your opinion that the best way to do this is cash for keys? No, no, no. okay, no, because most of the time, very popular in investing circles. I, I, and I have, if you look at my website, I have an article that talks about that. It, it, it dealt with moratoriums, like hanging over with concerned cash for keys. 
the problem is, is you're, you're right now, once evictions are back up and running, you're talking about five weeks. Um, and the cost is going to be you know, a flat fee for the attorney and the court costs. Uh, all in, you're, you should be less than, better be less than $500. So cash for keys, and what are you going to offer them? But the, the cash for keys more isn't so much the attorney costs and eviction costs, it's the stories of the ten thousand dollars. Property it's, preservation. If you if you're like, hey, if this person's behind and, and you're like, hey, I need rather I'm not gonna evict you, I'm gonna make an offer before I evict you, give you five hundred dollars, which I'm gonna have to pay anyways to evict you. They don't know that. Be like five hundred dollars, I get the keys by Saturday, we'll train, we'll change mm -hmm. hands and you get them out and they're happy because they're like, sweet, my landlord's gonna be five hundred bucks to leave. I'm not gonna do Most ten thousand dollars worth of damage. So the re you're talking about retaliatory damage. Right, right, right. like the story I, I that she said. You know, like, I don't see that. You don't see it very often. I've heard that. We get a couple times. I haven't heard of it personally, but in the national or global well, website. I think that also comes down to it's tenant screening. Yeah. Yeah. I put an emphasis on tenant screening up front and then not being an asshole landlord throughout the process where you fix what you're supposed to fix. I, I, right? I mean, I, I think that's the best way to operate. And I hope I never have to come to that. But when I, if I ever come to that fork in the row, I feel like it's pretty decent option if I can convince them because if we're not, if, if we've gotten to that point, we're not friends. Like, sure. we're, like something's went wrong and we have a disagreement. Yeah. We both, both may feel that we very have very valid opinions and that. And I don't think you'll see the retaliatory on. damage on, I mean, you're talking about this much of a case okay. I've, I've ever seen. That's good to know. Yeah. Right. Chad, what are other items like that, uh, the no lien and the lease that you have available that we, we could use as a research? Um, you know, that you've spent in the real estate world, sometimes they spend years working on their operating agreement mm -hmm. or something of the sort. And so, what are other resources that you have that we can? So, the operating agreement is a big one, and especially with partners, so you want that buy sell provision in there. Um, and it's, there's five D's, right? It's, there's death, divorce, yep. disinterest, dishonesty, disability. It's going to happen to you and your partner. You can't avoid it. And when it happens, you want to know, okay, what do we do with the assets? If James and I own, a, own an LLC with property in it and, and I die, I don't want my, my wife to have to you know, beg him for the funds that she's entitled to, right? And at the same time, if if uh, I just like, hey, we're moving to California, I'm ready to cash out. I don't want to fight over the value of the property. That's so what's in it. It's a little easier with, with real estate because the value is the value of the property. It's a little easier to determine. Uh, buy some of it. They're still important because you want to be able to have that mechanism in place that says, what do we do when this happens? What mechanism are you using for valuation? Uh, appraisal typically. I mean, that's what I'm saying. With, with real estate, it's a little easier because it's what the value of the property is. A little different with with investment properties, because it's it's okay. What's the value of the property as a cash flowing asset versus yeah, yeah. yeah? But there's different tools you can use. You can say still what it's going to sell for. So ultimately, it's you list the property and sell it, or you get an appraisal and you and your your partner says we're going to go off this valuation method, or or you say it's um, our our revenue stream for the past our tax returns. We use our tax returns the past three years on the revenue stream of this property. And then we're going to multiply, have a multiplied factor of what that's worth for you to buy me out. What are the five D's again? Death, dishonesty, disinterest, divorce, disability. I think the biggest problem, like you said, is either divorce or death. Because, you know, I might want to be in business with you, but if something happened, I may not want to be in business with your spouse. Exactly. Right, that's it. Or, or if you get divorced, then your spouse wants half of your interest. Right. And then all of a sudden, I'm in partnership with you. Yeah. Ooh, how does that work? <laughs> How do I protect entities like that from a divorce situation? <laughs> that's in business with somebody who's married. <laughs> well, that's, that's your buy self provision with your partner. Are you talking about if, if you have it by yourself? You no, okay, divorce? so let's do this scenario where I'm, I'm a 50% member of LLC, then I get married and I get divorced, and now my spouse is going after me for my assets yeah. as part of my divorce proceedings. Mm -hmm. How is the LLC stuff 
is that protected or unprotected if I don't have like a prenup in place with that spouse? No, I mean, they can, it's, it'd be similar to a garnishment order. So they can't just come in there and, and take over the rights, um, but they could have, they could have access. The district, what would happen is your LLC would still go to you and your partner, but then the distributions and they'd be responsible for distributions on how the divorce decree would say. So I need to be proactive if I wanted to exclude my real estate holdings from a future divorce decree. Who's divorced? It's mine. <laughs> so they didn't have a girlfriend. So I have a I have a member LLC, Optimism. I'm an unmarried man. What if I get married and then I get divorced and that Ex-wife is coming for blood. <laughs> Do I have to give her half yeah. of my assets, including well, half of my real estate holdings? And he is a marital boss, so everything goes in there. So now you'd have to okay. you probably just value the what yeah, that's worth. This, and then this is a I don't do divorce law, so I don't really know the ins and outs of what the what I everything goes in marital pot, but I don't know how they would determine it'd be no different than well I'm I'm the breadwinner and my wife was stay at home and what she entitled to, et cetera. It all goes into that factoring. Yeah, I, I think over. they put a valuation on the business. And May I change the subject? The cash um, what's the multiplying right. factor that you normally use with real estate? Usually it's, sorry, no. usually we don't. Usually it's just the value of the property. Okay. okay. And in business, do you do operating agreements for business as well? Yeah. Uh -huh. And what's Cheaper, the multiplying either. factor that you normally use for valuation of businesses? Those, it depends. So when you're talking about service industry, um, sometimes we'll offer just three times multiplier. Yep. Um, if you start getting into a company that's selling assets, like they're, they're a car dealership, or but still a lot of times you're going to get appraisal on what the value of the property being held is. Um, so a lot of times the, the multiply factor is for service industries. Okay, got it. I have a question. Let's back up to the LLC thing. So I have um, properties in a solo 401k trust that I'm a trustee of. Mm -hmm. I I don't have enough. I'm, I'm getting close probably to where I do. It is above my risk threshold to try to separate them. Is there a way to separate them when they're part of a single trust like that? For um, liability purposes? So is this just is it like a self-directed IRA? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, same thing. Or I mean, not the same thing. Very similar. similar yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Just I had I had to talk to the CPA on that one. I was thinking you just would create a new one and then transfer the assets because they're not you're still not personally benefiting from it. Well, so the rules are that you can't live in it. You can't if you sell it, you can't collect that capital and go back into the right. Yeah, that's all. It's own financial entity, yeah, you know, separate from me and so right. and that or whatever. But I don't think there'd be any risk of just quoting a new one and then transferring out of that. I don't think you'd violate the rules. I have to look into it more though. So build a second trust and transfer money between them or whatever. Well, you would that's just have the same problem James was talking about. Is I'm building up, I'm I'm contributing monthly capital to it to as, as a retirement mm -hmm. fund. So. So as I'm building up, waiting for enough to buy the next. Wait, what's your risk you're trying to avoid? Well, just liability. Like if if a tenant sues because they're being rented. No, but your your self directed IRA is the member of the LLC, right? It has um, a membership interest. In well, right now there, there's no there's no LLC period. Oh, you so, just have the property. So the uh, the properties are just part. They're assets of the trust. And oh. um, well, you're not doing any liability protection then. Yeah, yeah. You're, just, you're no different than owning your personal name. But if they, yeah. Well, they, they couldn't get to me personally. I don't think, right? Because it's a trust. No, but they'd still have. You're not. I just started this recently, and so I'm fairly new on this. Most of my stuff's like that. Okay. But but the I really want this to do this self directed because it's all it's yeah. twenty five percent tax savings on yeah. Roth. Rent. Like, usually it's the self directed IRS is just another member of the LLC. So I can make an LLC right now and then the trust owns and then it. Owns it. Okay. 
So that's that's just the sound like yeah. Weeds. Hold on, let's break that down. Yeah, yeah let's break this down. Uh -huh. Get in the weeds for some right, of us. I'm gonna get it on the board again. So I start a new LLC, Mary Hotel LLC. Mm -hmm. Then I say I'm gonna open up a self-directed IRA, and it's gonna be a member of the Mary Hotel LLC. Right. It's the owner. It's the owner. So the trust is 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 like a person on paper, right? It's just like a human being. Yes. With the name, yes. like that's what Benjamin Trust. Yeah. So it's like a replica of uh, the LLC. So if you were to call this on the Secretary of State, it would say the owner of this LLC is mm -hmm. Barry Buckell yeah. RA Trust. Gotcha. So I, don't, I don't list that. So that's it. When you do your filings, you don't have to list those names. I don't. My clients. Yeah. I put the name of the LLC. I don't put the principal on there. The ask for it is not required. You have to put a bit, you have to put an address for the principal place of business, but you don't have to put the number in. But the key, the key takeaway for me there is that you need to have that LLC protection no matter what, however you deviate from that, whether it's a trust or an IRA or an LLC. Well, he's not doing the, he's doing the trust for tax benefit purposes. Right, but he doesn't have liability protection. No different than, he's just bundling. He just needs to figure out when you're, so you don't have a way to break off that bundling. Is a problem. They all have to be in. I mean, same checking account problem. They all have to be in a. The money has to be in a checking account yeah. that's part that's owned by the trust. Yeah. And um, I can't interchange personal. Right. I can't even hire myself as a realtor to right. buy assets for that trust. I have to do it. I have to do an amendment that says like I don't get commission. I'll reduce the. Right. So like, there's all kinds of that rules as far as financial. <laughs> Yeah, but you can still have your your trust can still own have ownership of multiple LLCs. Yeah. So that's what you would want to start doing is just create the LLC and let the trust own that. So, so your then, trust is going to fund so, a new LLC. So right now the trust the name on the deed is a trust. Yeah. So should I change that to LLC then? We have to create the LLC. Yeah. Create the LLC and then quick claim deed it to the LLC. No warranty deed. Warranty deed. Warranty deed. That's the other that's the other thing I see a lot of investors screw up on. <laughs> Is, I would have just done it. So <laughs> just write yeah. that down. I just shouldn't say screw up, but so everyone knows the difference between quick claim, special warranty deed, warranty deed. Let's get yeah. a lesson. Yeah. Tell us, yeah. drop some yeah. knowledge bombs on us. <laughs> quick claim deed means I'm going to sell you this piece of property. I'm not going to warrant anything on there. So if you want to buy, um, you want to buy Banker's Life Field House, I'll sell it to you for 100 bucks. Quick claim. And then when you find out I don't own it, you can't do anything about it. Because I, I said it's quick claim. It just means whatever interest I do happen to have in that, I'm giving you. I'm not making any representations on it, but whatever I happen to own, it's yours now. That's a quick claim. So when you find out, I mean, this title is garbage, you can't do anything about it. Okay, that's a quick claim. So warranty to do this, I'm giving you a, a representation that I have ownership, that I have free and clear, I'm warranting it to you. Now you can sue me, because I've now I'm represented. But, but in that case, like it's all my stuff. Why would I do it? Like, I don't know if it's more costly for warranty than quick no, claim, but. there's not. Okay. The so. difference is this is, so a lot of times this comes up when, um, Doug, you own property, you finally get married, <laughs> and then you quick claim it to you and your, your new wife, right? So she's on title now. And then this is a property you just bought a year ago, you know? Someone comes out of the woodwork and says, actually, I don't have property. And they're going to sue you and your wife now, and you have no one then to sue. Okay. Alternatively, if you warranty it, you're actually going to sue yourself, and your title insurance will probably kick in. But without that, you don't have any title insurance because they're going to sue you and your wife who quick claimed it, and then theoretically, you would have severed that title insurance from there. So there's really so the warranty no reason doesn't. to do a quick claim date. No. Well, but you, I mean, except for if you don't want to buy a title, a new title insurance policy. So you're going to have to pay for a new policy, right? If you're on with a warranty deed? No. No? No. You don't have to do insure closing. Because it's going to carry over from the, the person that you're buying from. They're, they're, they're warranting it. So it's, it's a chain, right? So it's the chain game. So, chain of title. Yeah. So you're going to sue one, <laughs> two, three. So here's a warranty deed. Here's a warranty deed. This is the insured closing. Okay. This is the owner.
I can't hear anything. Is there any sound? There's no sound. Can you hear me? There's no sound. They check buyer and seller for I think that's judgments. what your lenders want to make sure you don't have a bunch of judgments out there before they loan you more money. No, that's maybe, but even then, they, they still have first priority. So if I have I have judgments against me and I acquire property and I have a and I take a mortgage out, that mortgage is priority over judgments against me. Janice, is if it good now? That house. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. No, if it's you have to sell, but when you're when you're selling that property, the lien first but the mortgage is always primary the mortgage always has first priority and then it's first in line first in time first in line mm -hmm. Got it. so if I have judgments against me yes it's judgment one which was secured in 2015 judgment two, 2018 the 15 has priority to get paid but the mortgage on the property will have priority over all those and the title companies when they see those judgments then they've got to address those from closing proceeds in theory Pay and pay them for on behalf of the seller. I'm talking about the buyer. Yeah. Well, your lenders, you're gonna have a tough time getting a loan if you've got judgments against. You. And that's what I'm. And, and I think that's why your lender does the mortgage policy, isn't it? Well, I don't, I don't know why if it's not? the mortgage policy. But they're gonna get a copy of the title commitment that shows it. Anything else, Jen? Um. I had a question. I have a client that came to me and said they wanted to. They have a rental property. They want to sell it. The tenant is in there, and she she did a handwritten lease with him. If she sells it, is he just out? The tenant? Yeah. 
Are you asking? Chief? Not if they have a copy of the handbook written lease. Are you asking if the tenant is out? Yes. Does no. he ask? Does he have to move, or does he get to stay? You acquire subject to. So if there's a, a tenant in place, you buy it subject to that. Tenant's rights. Yeah. Tenant's rights. Yeah. And that's why what what I recommend is you get if you're buying property tenant occupied, get a tenant uh, estoppel. So get a tenant estoppel. What that is is it's it's a it's another it's a very very short contract and it's signed by the tenant. It just says, "Do you have a valid lease? Yes. Is everything in compliance? Yes. Is this the monthly rent? Yes. Are you paid current? Yes. Do you have any lawsuits against the landlord? No. So then once you acquire property, you can't have the tenant be like, oh, we had a handshake deal. I'm supposed to be living here for free for the next six months. What's then, that called? Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> If someone just go to my website, there's an article. Yeah. Yeah. Estoppel. Yeah. Can you watch it? Um, spell that? I don't know that word. E yeah. Stoppel. Right? Yeah. With T O P P L E? Yeah. E L. E L. E L. Yeah, you got it. E L. E L. That's a new word to me. Yeah. Yeah. Stoppel. Yeah. But oh. it, it, there's a little article on my website. You want to read. Uh, what yeah. is your website? Wait, let's see. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, rollinslegal.com. Where's your um, office? Uh, I do shared office space out of Launch in Fishers. So right behind the Super Target. Good networking. Uh, so let's let's have that scenario where basically what you just described, where we're really savvy investors, as you know, and uh, we're gonna buy so we're gonna buy a tenant occupied mm -hmm. property. Mm -hmm. The lease is in place. Yeah. I have a copy of the lease. Mm -hmm. It's decent. Yep. Um, what prevents, what kind of due diligence do I need to be doing to where we close and then the tenant's like, oh, by the way, like I need you to fix like all this stuff. Like the that would be the claim. So you've got, that's hopefully you get that stop list in place. Cause then it says, do you, does, do you have any claims against the landlord? And it's yes or no. So then it's, if they say no, then they can still claim it. They can say, hey, this is supposed to be fixed. And if you're required, you have to do it. I'm just thinking of a scenario where the landlord is playing it off like everything is fine. And then mm -hmm. by the time you get to the tenant, they're like, you know, my right. washing machine doesn't work. My, you know, the roof leaks, right. like all this crap Get, Our, gets dumped on your plate because the landlord was, let's, let's say that the landlord was being negligent, but not to a degree where mm -hmm. the tenant wanted to pursue action. But now that I'm the new sheriff in town, they're like, well, you have that, you have your vendors out today to survive the closing. So your vendors out today would be the, as far as title being good, but then you could also have a, a separate part of that vendors update that says that the tenant has no claims against you that uh, the current and good standing, et cetera. You can just modify that to account for that. Okay. But ultimately, you're, the better tool is to get that established to get done. Okay. And sometimes, sometimes tenants are reluctant to sign that um, just because they don't, they don't know. Most of the time, they are, if you if the landlord explains it to them, they'll sign it. I have a question. Back to my previous example, if you had some bunch of cash in your account and then you transfer it out to your personal account mm -hmm. and then you got sued, don't they want to see your past couple of months bank statements? Yeah, but so you in that scenario though, I, you'd be okay, I, I would say. Now if you can't if you're transferring property out of an LLC to avoid liability, they can claw that back. Um, I've seen that. So you can't you know you're about to be sued and you're like, I gotta wipe this LLC out and you transfer all the, the, the real estate and stuff out of there, they can claw that back. But if you're just doing it in the normal course of business and it's like, hey, it's a distribution, here's the here's why we did it, they'd have a hard time on that. Especially when it's, when it's uh, the difference there too, is you're talking about, it's not the LLC's money at that point. Because um, typically what, what, what um, Bo is saying is you're, you're funding the LLC. So you should, have a, you should have a note. You really should give yourself a note. You should have a promissory note to your new LLC that says, this is a loan, you're gonna pay this back. So it shows liability there. So you're not, you're not uh, at that point, it's not the distributions necessarily, but it's a repayment of that loan. And then distributions would be a lot less, right? 
Yeah. Because typically your your cash flow the distributions on the property aren't I would assume they're not gonna be that high. Maybe over time, but even then, it's still after paying back liability. So that you know your, your note, your mortgage, all that, you should be just a note to the business. So if you you can fund it with some operating expenses and um, you can keep, I mean, can you keep, um, you know, the cash flow proceeds in that account? That's all safe. Yeah, you can, but again, you're going to get taxed on. So I would just, I would pull it out regularly. I mean, keep a, keep a slush fund in there for operating expenses. But beyond that, you know, you're, you're going to take all that out of there, but mostly it's going to be, I assume most of you guys are, are you buying property cash or are you taking mortgages out? Both. 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 That's a, a mortgage is another form of asset protection, right? Because if someone gets, if someone wants to see you, they're going to see a mortgage. I'm like, man, he's got a mortgage in front of me, so my chance of collection is lower. Hmm. Yeah. Oh. The, uh, do, do you do just general consultation? Mm -hmm. So instead of us peeing here, if we have another three hours worth of questions, we can just <laughs> call you up and be like. Yeah. How much? How much, uh, how much do I unravel my life? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just general consultation as well. Yeah. yeah. Your website's really impressive. I'm. I'm. Thank you for that resource. I'm happy to share that. I need some Chad money. You well spent, Bo. Anything else? Um. No. I. So I. I want to talk to you because I'm literally just entered into a contract two days ago. Okay. First invest, first hold property. Sweet. <laughs> it's working. The is yes. Yes. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, it is nowhere near where I, <laughs> my criteria. It is. <laughs> so, really adhering to the rules. <laughs> it's better than nothing. <laughs> it is, um, it's right next door to a good friend of mine lives in basically Irvington area and, and I'm there essentially every other week. So I thought it would be a handy way to keep track of the property. Mm -hmm. He can keep kind of keep track of it. Um $107,000. Uh, I think it's gonna rent for somewhere from a, between thousand and twelve hundred. Um, three bedrooms, one bathroom. It's got a bathroom in the basement. It's kind of gross. Gotta figure that part out. <laughs> Um, it's all limestone and concrete block, two car garage, um, full dry basement. It is really dry. <laughs> so cool. it's it's not, there's almost no exterior maintenance. It's gonna need some improvements. I mean, I, I might have to put, I might have to put 10 into it. Are you not inside the horse historic just took, are you? No. Okay, good. That's the idea. North side of 10th here. Street, it's not technically in Irving. Okay. okay. Make sure you, if you're going to acquire a property, make sure that you're, if you get into a historic district, be careful because mm -hmm. those repair costs are crazy. Yeah. So, so let's talk about, I'm going to buy it in cash and then ideally improve it and get a, and then get a loan on it, hopefully with a higher appraisal. So I, uh -huh. it lower reduces my amount of cash into it. Mm -hmm. But so like currently though, my, um, so before I do that, I assume I want to have the entity set up yeah. um, and take the finance. I don't know. I don't know how that's going to work. The loan is going to be, you know, I've got to, I want to have it properly titled in the, in the entity and not my real estate company. You probably entity. will not be able to. So a lot of times banks will be reluctant to loan the LLC money. Yes. Um, yes. They are going to, here's what typically happens is, you know, we have to get them to loan your personal name. And then what you do is you deed out your personal name into the LLC. Warranty deed. Yeah, warranty deed. Yeah, because we never do quick uh -huh. ah, You don't know. We do not do quick claim deeds here. Yeah. <laughs> they, these, they, they're good if you're the seller. And sometimes that comes up in familiar relationships too. Like, you know, grandma, when she passed away, the estate needs to deal over to that. Um, the estate doesn't want to take on the liability. So sometimes they're like, look, I really don't have a history of this. We are going to quick claim this. And you take it with something to that. They're not terrible. I'm not saying you can't get around them, but I don't want to scare you, but be careful. Um, but back to the question. Uh, so you're going to want to deed the property LLC. There is a risk of what's called the due on sales clause, right? So when you have a mortgage, it has in there that says if you transfer the property out of this or you sell it, then we can trigger the due on sales clause, which means all of it's due immediately. Um, so where I, where I mentored and 
he's been a trainer for 25 years. Never, he's seen it happen one time. And it was the one time is when the client called the mortgage company and said, hey, I'm doing this. And like, no, you can't do that. You gotta get right out of out. That's it. Because as long as you're getting paid, as long as the payments come in there, they don't. They don't How long is that? I mean, that aren't they gonna know it up front? Because what? I'm trans, aren't, I mean, is my mortgage company gonna know it up, up front? Because I'm transferring it from me just personally? Wait. You know, because if you're going to do all that, just wait a minute and, so, and then deed it over after the fact. So, yeah, if you're, you're going to do a cash out refi in your name because they won't lend you the money on an LLC that doesn't make you money. Yes. And then you're going to warranty deed it to your new entity that's going to hold it, and then you're going to keep paying that note. And you, you can pay the note out of your operating account. Mm -hmm. They don't care. What, okay. How long do they typically have on that do on sell before if they notice it? And oh, it's, it's in there forever. Anytime, yeah. I mean, I mean, so you do the warranty deed, and then ninety days later, they someone at the bank has nothing to do, and they're like flipping through records, they're like hey, this guy warranty deeded. They can they come at that point? Yeah. A year later? Yeah. Anything? So yeah. Can, you, can you just refinance stuff? Yeah. Typically, yeah. most of the time, if it happens, they're gonna they're gonna say we've noticed this happened, put it back. But again, like if they're getting paid the whole time, they don't. But I mean, before, but before they force me to pay it off, can I do a refi with somebody else? Yeah, because it's due on sale. It just means your notes due. Yeah. But you can say otherwise, but deed it back to your personal name. Uh, most of the time, I think that's what they would do. They'd say, "Look, you need to get this back in your own name." Okay. Yeah. But again, like I, I've never seen it happen because the the bank's not in the the bank is not in the business of vetting these things out like uh what's going on as long as the money's coming in there they don't have a reason to go investigate that thank you so much for your time today well, super appreciate you. it i know we're all going to put your contact information on our phone and um it's the best way to find that from your website yeah 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 it's very thorough mm -hmm. thank you Jen. yeah thanks for having me do you do uh, real estate law like buyer seller like our, in our transactional real, realtor yeah. world? Yeah, yeah. so I do, um, I know it's bad, but for sale by owners, kind of, it's an up and coming thing for, sorry, I know. But I, I do do Get us. <laughs> you did me. I, I tell my, I tell clients, like, look, I think a, a, an agent adds tremendous value. Um, Good stuff. But, you know, it's, it's kind of like the stock market, right? Like everyone thinks, you know, when the stock market's doing this, it doesn't matter what you buy, it's, you're gonna win. And same thing with real estate, now, that's how everyone's viewing it. It's like, all the tools are there. They see Zillow, they see what their neighbor's house was sold for, what this house across the street for, and they're like, I can miss at that. Uh, I, think, I think you guys have even more of a value when it's down market. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it's an up market, I, I know it's a harder sell for you guys. It's, it just is what it is. So I help out on those. Um, I do help a lot of just individuals, whether in, they're in a transaction, like, hey, we just want to get this contract reviewed. Usually, no, unless that comes up when there's a dispute on earth's money, when there's a, a request for mutual release um, or inspection. Um, I see a lot of. Yeah. You do handle that with yeah. potential litigation regarding it? It doesn't usually get there. Yeah. Um, and usually, when it you is. Did you write a good saber rattle or letter? I do, yeah. 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 I've had several of those. Love it. Um, and most of the time, it's. Huh? I see it more with, with inexperienced real estate agents yeah. where. They don't understand what they're allowed to demand or what they're required to fix on inspections. You know, they say, well, the the caulk in the shower is is busted up. We want to fix it. Well, no, you can't make that demand. You can ask, but if they say no, you, you can't say, well, I want out. Oh, I got a good one then. What is your stance on the roof is the biggest windows? Sure. Because yeah, how many like, windows? Yeah. Like it's, it's I, I would it's say like area. if it's one window, it's probably more maintenance. If it's fifteen in the or every window in the house, it feels like it's more like it is. So windows the and the roof area. are those gray areas because it has to the the definition has to severely or uh, what's the phrase impact the value or life of the property yeah. mm -hmm. or the health and safety of the occupant yeah so electric's easy like that the, the, the safety of the occupant like if it's electrically related things like that, that's pretty easy mold things like that but when you start getting in the windows where it's like man this is it's really maintenance I and mean, how do you justify that it's going to significantly impact the the value of the property but the habitability is in the one of the lines too and if you don't have any windows it's it fails that test and so if all the window seals are busted, right? Like if every, then there's no insulation. 
Yeah. Exactly. Like from the outside, I, I don't think you're going to say that there's no insulation. Yeah, it's more of a cosmetic issue no. than anything. Yeah. I think it it does go into that gray area, yeah. and I think that you'll you, you'll probably be more inclined to have people that are willing to address that when you start getting the bulk of that. Yeah. Um, but I've had it where people. Honestly, I've had it where people want to get out of contract because their relationship with their agent has deteriorated. <laughs> really? Yeah, and they're like, then you know why? It's like, I don't want to give this person any commission. That's great. I've had wow. it. I've, last week, I had a call. No. They're like, I've had to push everything, and this guy's doing nothing. And I'm like, well, it's like, look, you need to just push through this. I know he's done bad, but happens mm -hmm. but it's it was on that too it was effective in that market yeah yeah, yeah. It, it was as that they wanted some things done and their laundry list was probably longer than it should be um, but then the agent didn't really stay on top of the communication so yeah. then they got a counter offer back um, and they actually agreed to everything and then they still didn't want to do it because they're like oh this guy's like, well, like, that's not a valid reason to turn that contract yeah. um do you do documents for um uh, seller financing yeah, yeah. So you've got that's a good question. That's a good question. So bring the heat. I'm in. Yeah, I got a yeah, yeah, reading last night. I'm too. sorry, I have yeah, a call. Okay. I have to be. That's a good topic. You guys do need to learn about that. So there's there's land contract and then there's no mortgage opportunities. Can we have a part two with you? If Mary sets it up. He's gonna charge. Yeah, he's um, gonna sponsor. Preferably, if you're doing seller financing, um, you want to do so. It's it's inverse related. So if you're the buyer you want a note mortgage first. And then if you can't get that, then you want a land contract. And if you can't get that, then you want a lease and an option contract, right? If you're the seller, you want to do an option contract with a lease first. Can't get that, we we'll do a land contract. Can't do that, no mortgage, okay? And the reason is because if, if I'm a seller and I do it as an option contract with a lease and you don't pay, I can evict you, okay? If I do it as a land contract, doesn't care what you call it in there. You'll have a forfeiture clause in there. Indiana doesn't care. If you have equity in that property, I've got to foreclose on you. <clears throat> so it's it's that middle ground, mm -hmm. right? Because once you, you have to show that you've actually acquired equity in there. So if you default pretty early on, uh, there's probably going to be some acceleration clauses, penalty clauses where you might go to wipe out that potential equity and you might go to get forfeiture. Um, do you know what forfeiture is? Okay. Oh. So there's foreclosure, which means I have to go through the lawsuit and I have to foreclose on the property, it goes to a sheriff sale, potentially someone else could buy it and lose the property, right? To the value of the land contract. I, I can't get more than that. Um, forfeiture means I don't have to go through that process. I still go through a lawsuit, but I get the pile, I get property back to me. I don't have to go through the actual um, sheriff sale. That's forfeiture. And then you have the note mortgage, which obviously you're gonna do a foreclosure on that. Note mortgage is title actually, you lose title as a seller. Land contract title stays in your name, but they have an interest in the property at that point. There's a famous case, you've heard, have you ever heard of Rainbow Realty? No? Yeah. They're a big company that was, they would sell these dilapidated properties to people under land contract. Because if you sell under a land contract, I'm not a landlord, I have no responsibility. But they were doing this blend. It was like a rent to own. And it was, they were, they were evicting when it was convenient and then they were foreclosing when it was convenient. And it went to the Supreme Court of Indiana and they said, look, under this contract, you had liability as a landlord and you didn't do these things. So then they were subject to the, those criteria. So sometimes if you're doing property that's habitable, do an option contract with a lease. If it's not habitable, you don't want to do that because then you, you, your take on that liability as a landlord, and if it's not habitable, that's on you as a landlord. Mm -hmm. So you can get away with that on a land contract. You're not a landlord. So. Thank you. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. This was amazing. Yeah, feel free to check out my website, give me a call if you guys have follow up questions. Um, and good luck. Would you, I'd like to see a copy of that book sometime. Oh, no. we're like, we'll give you a Yeah, we'll get. Bye, Janice. Yeah. Bye. We've got some here.